Scripture reading today comes from the book of Matthew. I can get my fingers to work. Chapter 7. Judge not, Jesus says, that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice that the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take out the log out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Loving God. We ask that you open our eyes and open our ears that we might clearly see and clearly hear what you would have us learn from this simple text. But more than anything, Lord, open our hearts and make yourself a home. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I preached down in Miami last Sunday. I missed you all. Um, My friend, your friend, Dr. Boltina, came to me on Monday morning of the week prior, and as we were preparing to have a meeting, he said, uh, my dad died. And so we had to shift some things around a little bit, and it's kind of a difficult scenario down in Miami, but he said, would you go down and preach there, and I'll have Jeff come up and spend time with your loving group. And I, I thought that might be a good idea. But I thought, am I really the one to be able to help out in this scenario? Because there's some things we've been doing, and I don't know if they're going to like to see me very much. It worked out really well. It was really well received. I I shared with them that uh, every time I preached, their worship director, there was three services. He noticed this after the third service. He said, you know, after every single, or before every single time that you preached, you prayed Lord, open our hearts and make yourself a home. I said, it's the way I feel when we read the scriptures. That we are to open them up to us. That they become a part of us. That we become engulfed in what you're trying to teach us, God. Otherwise, why are we keeping this document? Why are we keeping these letters? If they aren't going to help us to change and transform more and more. And you're like this. And I said, I meant that. Every time I preach it, open our hearts, Lord. And make yourself a home. The greatest single cause of atheism, Brendan Manning wrote once, in the world today is Christians. Let me read that again. The greatest single cause of atheism, which is no believe in God, is in the world today is Christians. Who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. He writes, that is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. I could, I, I could imagine that. It's back to what I had mentioned a couple of weeks ago. Where my mom would share with us, everybody's watching, so careful how you carry yourself. And she would say, David Allen. Anytime my middle name was used, I knew I'd better pay attention. And so we look at the scriptures, we we ask the scriptures, Lord, what are you trying to teach us? What are you trying to show us? What's the whole point of us opening up this old book? I've got a lot of books. I know, I'm sure you have a lot of books. But we hold this one in reverence because it is the Lord speaking to us through these authors. And God is speaking into our lives with each story, with each parable, with each quote and statement from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. Jesus was known as someone who was full of grace and truth. It says in in John 1.14. 
He possessed both in fullness and it made him simultaneously, now get this, simultaneously intolerable and irresistible. There's something really, really special about that. Intolerable and irresistible. He spoke with such clarity that his enemies could not resist until they had to have him removed. He killed him. He exuded such grace that many of those who disagreed still couldn't, they just couldn't understand it, couldn't fathom being around him. What people experience with Jesus is a kindness that is irresistible. We've met people like that. A grace that is overwhelming and a truth that is unshakable as it is constant. Failing in either grace or truth puts us out of step with Jesus. Maybe that's what Brennan Manning, Brennan Manning was talking about. Truth without grace is fundamentalism. And grace without truth, well, that's just sentimentality. To dispel the tension here, we must turn to perhaps Jesus' most misunderstood teaching. Judge or not to judge. I mean, this is such an interesting topic. It's even talked about the likes of folks that don't even follow Jesus. And it was Jesus talking about it. Don't judge or you'll be judged. You know what that really means? Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I'm going to believe what I want to believe. Don't judge or you'll be judged the same way. Right? I think that's missing the point a little bit. So I wanted to look at this. I wanted to understand what it meant. I, I, I typed into Google, which is the Holy Spirit, um, to many. Although when I typed this in, I, I, I questioned that because I said, the Bible says not to, and then I just left a blank. And I wanted to see what it was going to fill in because it always fills in because it knows what I'm thinking, right? The Bible says not to, and one of the things it put down there was worry. Don't worry. That, okay, the Bible does teach that. The Bible says not to get tattoos. I'm like, oh, snap. I've got a couple. The Bible says not to eat. It, 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 it said that. I don't think the Bible says that. So I'm starting to question this Holy Spirit thing with Google. But then the, it said the Holy Spirit says not to judge. Judge not. Judge not. It is such a phrase that is thrown around today. Don't tell me I'm wrong, in other words. If I'm crazy enough to say it out loud, I must believe it enough. And so if you're telling me I'm wrong, well, that just makes me uncomfortable. So don't judge me. Problem is, Jesus, the one who you know, he's the one that uttered these words. He didn't share our assumptions about the importance of keeping our opinions about morality to ourselves, did he? He kind of let everybody know what he was thinking about, whatever it may be. He was constantly making public judgments. He was constantly, constantly letting people know, I'm not sure that's what you ought to be doing. But he does share in this text, it's easy for us then to go about and say, well, I found a group and I don't think they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, so I'm going to pass judgment on them. I, I, I don't think that's what Jesus was suggesting any either. Because he's going to say to the likes of you and the likes of me, hey, dude, you don't have it figured out, so don't tell other people that they don't either. I get that. In other words, you've got a log in your eye and you're talking about someone else's speck in their eyes. Jesus called some people's works evil. He did. John 7, 7. He even said in Matthew, told a group of sincere people, you're wrong. Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. You don't get it. You're wrong. But he left it there. He couldn't have meant keep your ideas about religion and morality to yourself. When Jesus denounced judging, he wasn't telling us to stop assessing opinions or behavior. Instead, I believe he was telling us to avoid a graceless, critical posture that writes other people off. And I think there's a difference. We are, we, we are entering into political season. 
You know, like, David, where have you been? We've, we've been in it now for a little while. I think that there has to be a, a bit of understanding how to have a conversation with our friends filled with grace. Rather than, I can't believe that knucklehead is voting for so-and-so. Jesus told people that they were wrong, that their works were wrong, and, and he also made sure it was clear that he came to save the world, not condemn it. He came to be part of the answer, not part of the problem. Speaking truth is hard. It's difficult when you speak some sort of condemnation. But I think the antidote to judging in our culture is to saturate our culture with grace. We can disagree. We can have differing opinions. We should. If we all thought alike, we'd be robots. But we should be saturated with grace. A culture that acts and feels the same way Jesus did. I've come up with a few signs um, and to show you that, that I think we need to do this. So I sort of want to walk through some. The first one is that we're more enraged at someone else's sin than our own. Really? I mean, I, 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 some of these I know that they're as my kids would say, I get a point for the obvious game. But it's true, we, we seem to find that we get obsessed with what's going on in someone else's life, and we ask the world to accept what is going on in our own. Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a wonderful pastor, theologian, that was in a concentration camp. He, he, he was given his release, saying, you know, you can go ahead and go home, you're done. And he said, no, 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 I'm going to hang out with these other prisoners here because I want to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, I love the Lord. I don't think I would do that. I mean, I, I, I love sharing the love of Christ, but I think I'd want to go home and be with my kids and be with my wife. He wanted to stay there to share with them because he wanted them to understand the true gospel and what this was about. He didn't agree with anything that the Nazis were doing. But as it says in his memoirs, there were guards and whatnot that came to believe and to understand this gospel he spoke about was real. No matter what we feel, how our righteousness, how right you think you are compared to what another is, there's always a different way to see things through a conversation. We get blind spots, and by definition, those are we have places in our hearts that we don't realize or we've come to accept is okay. I read a, a Christian counselor, his name is Paul Tripp, says, while we, while we blind ourselves to our own sin, others, though, have 20-20 vision. So the second point is we we, we seem to refuse, and I've come across this more and more in conversations. We refuse to forgive. We refuse to forgive. We refuse to forget. You may have said that before, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget. That's the same as refu refusing to forgive. To refuse to forgive someone is to intentionally be ignorant to that God has already forgiven all of your past. And when it says in the scripture, he's not only forgiven you, he's cast it as far as the east is from the west, it says in the Psalms. That's also forgetting, because that's pretty far. Forgive but not forget is just another way of saying, I'm going to say I forgive you but make my, to make myself better and to show myself better, but uh, you still owe me because of what happened. I'm still going to hold that against you because of what you did. Friends, that isn't forgiveness. Forgiveness means absorbing the debt So Jesus did on the cross and offering only the goodness in return. No strings attached. That's how you were forgiven and how I was forgiven. And that's the model that we are to forgive others. As hard as that is. Third thing is, is we cut off those who disagree with us. We cut them out of our lives because they disagree with us. Well, hey, have you thought how boring our world would be if everybody agreed with you? 
I mean, I know we want that sometimes. God knows. I want that when it's time to pick where we're going to eat at night, if we're going to a restaurant. I can't stand, and I'm sure you get in the car. Where do you guys want to eat? I don't know. What do you want to do? Uh, how about if we go here? No, I don't want to go there. No, no, it's up to you. We can go wherever. Okay, then I want to go here. No, I don't want to go there. Right? Do you have this? Do you have this? And I know you do with all those grandkids that come by. I mean, all these same conversations. What would the world be like if we agreed on everything? I don't think we'd get anything done. Because I like sitting around on a Sunday afternoon when there's football on or a baseball game. And if everybody agreed with me, there wouldn't be anything done after worship but a nap and then watching a ball game. We wouldn't do anything. And if everybody agreed with me, I would be, we would all be playing in the shallow end of the pool with grandkids. That, that, that's what it would be. Everybody would. We wouldn't do anything if everybody agreed with me. If everybody, well, I shouldn't go on. I was going to say the Cubs. I mean, everyone would strike out against the Cubs. Every batter that goes against. But that's too far. The fourth thing that we do is we gossip. Oh, do we gossip. Oh, we're good at gossip. Gossip is judging because it condemns. It, in, in a way, the person that we're talking about, it condemns them because it doesn't want to correct the person. It doesn't even give the person the chance to explain how they were acting. It just talks about them like that's the way they are. We're going to write them off that way. Gossip is awful, guys. And it's a, it's a form of judging. We don't think they can change, so we're going to talk about that act as the defining moment of their lives. And it makes me sad. But you know, if we're going to get personal with this, we're going to also talk about the fact, the fifth point is, we refuse to receive criticism. Who wants to be criticized? I have, uh, and, and maybe Chris recognizes this, as photographers, you better embrace receiving criticism if you want people to really tell you how you're doing with your work. If you really want to understand, really want to grow as a photographer, you'd better embrace criticism. Again, if you didn't, all your photos would be the same as the first one you ever took. And I don't know what Chris is like, but if I go back and look at my first photos, I can't stand it. And it it's just the growth is not there. Criticism can be helpful. It can help us to grow. If it's criticism for the sake of criticism, well, clearly none of us want that. But if we can understand and learn something from something said, we understand how somebody feels about a certain thing, we have the ability to grow. Then the last thing I, I want to bring up is that we write someone off as, as hopeless. All of us, every one of us, is made in the image of God. There's no, I don't think we'd have an argument denying that every single one of us is made in God's image yet there are times when we write some folks off we write so and so off because well and they're a Cardinals fan I understand that but it doesn't mean we ought to writing off someone who's hopeless means that you think that they're past saving and I really don't think that has anything to do with a loving God so it doesn't mean make any sense for me to bring up the negative without offering some ideas on how we can fix this. And I want to tell you right here, right now, I think the solution is first, it happens in the pews. And, and even my pew right here, even Dick's pew. Before the gospel I love can spill out into the streets, it has first got to saturate the pews of our churches. It has to saturate this chair it has to saturate our choir. It does. I already know the choir. It does. I once read that love on display was Christ's final apologetic to a skeptical world. Love on display. Usually that's interpreted to mean we validate Christ's message by our excessive generosity towards outsiders, but it isn't that. That's not what it's about. Specifically, the author was referring to the love that exists between believers. Jesus said that too in John 13, 35. He told us the world would know we are his by the way that we love one another. I want you to know how odd I find it that I have to preach that from a pulpit. 
And I'm not even necessarily talking about our church. I'm talking about church, church. That we need to love one another. We need to be sure that people understand that. We need to love those that aren't here but will one day. Those yet to come. My friends, our brothers and sisters are out walking on the street maybe at this hour. We need to love those folks because they're just not sitting in the pew at the moment. But they will one day maybe. That's loving the church. Not first the way that we love the world. But the way that we love one another will be the way that the world looks at us. And they're watching. Some of the most zealous to impact the world with the love of the gospel overlook the crucial family first dimension of the gospel of grace. I think it's amazing that you would look past family love. If love is not first lived out in the Christian, Christian family, how could we ever expect it to spill into the world? Grace can only spill onto the streets if it is first overflowing in the hearts of God's people, and that's the church. You might be sitting there saying, you know, David, I don't feel very loving right now. You don't know the stuff I'm going through. You don't know the hard difficulties that I'm going through. And it's true, you're right. I would also suggest to you that, that uh, I know a lot of you. And I get it. There are times where we don't feel very loving. There are times where I have critics on social media that want to come after me because of the way I feel about certain issues with the church. And... God says, love them too. They're your neighbors. But I don't want to. But God says, just go ahead and do it anyway. The church was created to be a miracle of love. I love that image. I mean, I. the way things are seen is so important the image that we have in our minds as to how things are is so important. It reminds me, I, I, I can't help but going back and thinking about childhood. I used to love my grandmother up in Montana. She, she, would, she was a voracious reader. And why I love that as, the, as a kid is she read comic books. I promise you, we would come and visit every August, the 1st of August, and we would get sackfuls of comic books. It was an amazing ride home because you didn't have to tell your brother to hurry up because you wanted to read the comic book also. You had a stack sitting next to you. And they'd be filled with, and I don't know what, she loved it. She, I mean, it, we almost should have kept the collection. It would have been amazing. Of course, they would not have been untouched, and usually a collection's amazing if it's untouched. These were poured through, especially the superheroes. I used to love to read the stories about the superheroes. I mean, I, I could say that I was a fan of Batman, all right? I like Batman. Uh, and I thought Superman was okay, okay, that, that's pretty fun. Batman had cooler toys. But I was obsessed with Spider-Man. I thought Spider-Man was the bomb. Maybe because in my basement with the paneled walls and the sofa down there, I could crawl along the top of the sofa and act like Spider-Man. I thought that was really cool. I mean, I, and I'm confessing, Mom, I always did that, and you weren't around. But there was also someone on during that time, there, there was the invisible man. I thought that was the dumbest thing to ever have in a comic book. You can't see him. How in the world are you going to make a comic about him? But there was a show on, a show about the 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 the. Invisible man. I thought about this as an adult. I, I, I think it would be actually really cool now. I've given up on the Spider-Man thing because I don't think I could swing around like I would have as a kid. But, but invisible man? Can you imagine if you're an adult being invisible? Not only could I get into every basketball game I ever wanted to get into, but I would be able to sit at the end of the bench and they wouldn't know. Not only would I go to every single Cubs game, but I would sit right behind second base. I mean, I'd move in case a ball was hit there. I wouldn't want to get hit, but, but I would sit not only at the game, I would be in the game. 
But then I realize it probably wouldn't be as much fun in a football game, right? I mean, it'd be kind of interesting to be near the coach and hear what he says and all this kind of stuff. But then the danger comes when they win the game and he gets doused with Gatorade, right? If you saw the show, The Invisible Man, that's how they used to show where he was. People would pour paint on him. Well, everybody would see that I was standing next to the coach, and they'd say, what in the world is that? And then nobody would watch it. But it's that, it's, it's that pouring the paint on the invisible man. The reason I tell the story is because that's sort of who we are supposed to be for the church. We are supposed to be that paint. When we love one another, that is supposed to be the paint that goes on to the church where people say, oh, I get the image now. This church isn't as invisible as to who they are anymore. I get who they are. When we love one another, people will see that as a vision to say, I get who they're about. You know, those guys over there on the, the street, you know, just down the way, they're right in the middle of our neighborhood. In fact, they're next to the golf course where I go on Sunday mornings. They really love one another. Have you seen how they do that? We are the paint so that it can be plainly seen who we are to be, the gospel is to be for the church. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that's the way we're seen. Not we, but we the church. Are we full of grace and truth? So as a recap, I, I, I want to speak a few ways that I believe the gospel, grace, and generosity should shape us. And again, particularly in the midst of a political season. Number one, let's give people the benefit of the doubt. When we have our conversations, whatever it may be, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure they mean well. Let's assume the best in others. Didn't Jesus say that about the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If I want people to assume the best in me, how about I do the same for them? Let's assume the best in others. Let's promote a culture of grace. Let's promote a culture that people, it's on our sign, maybe that means something, but let, let's, let's try to have people understand who we are and whose we are. Let's push for direct, honest dialogue. Let's outdo one another in showing grace. I dare you. I was talking about kid stuff earlier. When we dance with this kind of divine tension with grace and truth, Christianity becomes alive and powerful. I want to read a letter for you in closing. It's a letter from a Birmingham jail um, that, written by Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. He said, There was a time when the church was very powerful. In the time when the early Christians rejo rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer, suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of the popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed society. Small in number, but they were big in commitment. They were too God-intoxicated to be intimidated. By their effort and example, they brought an end to such ancient evils and as infanticide. and the gladiator games. Things are different now. And if today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as irrelevant, as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Every day, he says, I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. Who are we, church? We thought the more we become like the world, the more the world would accept us and want to be a part of us, when actually what we're learning is the opposite is true. The more we become like the world, the more we become irrelevant to them and maybe even disgusting in the eyes of our Lord. How tragic if the church today forsakes the gospel in favor of that kind of life. Truth without grace is judgmental fundamentalism. Grace without truth, as I said, is sentimentality. Combine both and you'll be like Jesus. Infectious in finding people wanting to be a part of all of that. 
See, I believe that the world needs a church infected, infused with the gospel. I believe that the world needs us to understand whose we are and remember it ourselves. I believe in God's grace. Because He was gracious enough for the likes of me and the likes of you.